Hello, I'm Neil Quigley and welcome to the latest episode of my podcast. This week, it's a John Nettle special. When I was working at Ivel FM in Somerset doing the morning show, one day I got a call in the studio with somebody asking to speak to a member of the Neil Quigley Show production team. Now, I'll be honest, it was just me. I was the entire team. I used to produce and present that daily show. But I was on air, I was quite busy, and I was intrigued who it was. So my reply was, I'm really sorry, they're all busy on air at the moment. Can I take a message and get someone to give you a call back? As I took the message, they gave me their phone number and they told me they were from a TV production company who were looking to speak to me about featuring possibly in a TV documentary. That afternoon, I gave them a call back myself, mainly because I was very interested in what was going on and wanted to find out more myself rather than leave it to another member of the team. And also, there was no team, it was just me. So it had to be me that called back. As it turns out, the reason they were calling, they were a Somerset-based production company and they were making the second series of a documentary that they'd previously made the year before for ITV West Country. It was hosted by none other than John Nettles. The show was called... Nettles applauds and it featured him going around the West Country speaking to different people who do different jobs from actors to comedians to all sorts of different people all who were in some way related to the arts to find out exactly what they did and how maybe that varied from who they were and what they were like in real life. Each of the shows came under a different title where they looked at different aspects of people's personality and traits inside and outside whatever their job was. Now, I'm not going to lie, I was quite excited about this proposal and the chance to be on the television and be with John Nettles. But first, I had to get agreement from my boss. What they wanted to do was come in with a film crew one day, film me doing a bit of the show and interviewing John Nettles on my radio show. And then after the radio show had finished, he was going to interview me for the TV show solely. So I got to quiz him, then later on he got to quiz me. It would all be tastefully done. The radio station would get a mention and would get some branding in the background. Bit of free advertising gets me on the TV and I get to meet John Nettles. Luckily for me, my boss was excellent down in Yeovil and decided to go with it. He let me do it. He said, yeah, OK, if you organise it all, you make it happen, then yes, I've got no problem with them coming in and filming you. So I called them back and gave them the green light to let them know I was very interested in being involved. A couple of months down the line, we set a date that John was due to come in on my morning show. We'd do some filming before, we'd film the interview, then after the show had finished, he'd interview me and the tables would be turned. So here is that interview I did on my radio show with John Nettles when he came in to film the TV documentary Nettles Applauds. Neil Quigley. Pleased to welcome my special guest into the studio this morning. Good morning, John Nettles. Good morning to you. How the devil are we? Exceedingly well, and also the better being here. That's good to hear. Now, you're currently filming, quite literally currently filming, a brand new television series, which we'll come on to. We'll talk about that later this hour, but I want to talk about you firstly this hour if that's okay i didn't realize this you're a west country boy i come from uh, st Austell in cornwall the attractive part of cornwall of course must have been great growing up around there it was wonderful in fact i had the i think the idyllic childhood i spent the rest of my life trying to get back there i was so happy talking about your acting career firstly and you weren't one of these child stars as far as i can work out it came a bit later in life well, it happened, actually, it happened at school. Uh, I went to St. Austell Grammar School, now unfortunately defunct. But there's a wonderful teacher there called Mr. Farnham Flower. Freddie Farnham Flower, he was called, and he saw some glimmer of talent in me and gave me Macbeth in the school play. And I didn't know much about the ambic pentameter, but I knew a good fight when I saw one. I killed about half a dozen third formers in the course of the play and uh, took to the, the boards then, really. You went to Southampton University, actually studying history and philosophy. Yes, I did. I did. For uh, Yes. <laughs> they gave me a doctorate the other day. Oh, congratulations. I, I'd done even less work for that than I did for the original degree as well, I understand it. But at the university I joined the drama club and we were fortunate enough to win the NUS Drama Festival one year. Uh, the competition wasn't up to much, obviously, and I got a job at the Royal Court Theatre, which was then the theatre to be employed in. It was a wonderful time. It's the time of, you know, John Osborne's look back in anger and all the rest of those things, and some wonderful directors down there like Bill Gaskell, Peter Gill and so on, who are still with us. 
And from that, you uh, ended up joining the Royal Shakespeare Company and playing the theatre in Stratford-upon-Avon. From your first story about Macbeth at school, obviously Shakespeare is something you've always loved, always felt passionately about. It is. Any actor worth his salt will tell you that his first love and his last love probably is Shakespeare. Take Patrick Stewart, for example. I mean, he did years and years and years of Star Trek and instantly that finished, he was back as fast as anything to Stratford on Avon to play the Shakespearean roles. Which uh, is pretty similar to your good self, because we've got to mention, we can't have you here and not mention Jim Bergerac, I'm afraid. You've got the, uh, the TV show that kind of, well, put Jersey on the map, basically. How did that role come about for you? I was locked in the decent obscurity of the, the classical theatre. I was playing at the Old Vic when Robert Banks Stewart, the creator of uh, Shoestring and Target and other shows, in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, saw me down there and uh, thought I'd be good as a Jersey cop for some reason. What had happened was that uh, dear old Trevor Eve, who'd done shoestring, he decided to do no more shoestring and he went off to the United States to become a great star. And that left a gap in the BBC schedules and they had to fill it and they filled it with Bergerac and me. So I'm ever grateful to Trevor Eve for my career. Ten years Bergerac ran, taking up, I would imagine, most of your time. What was sort of, if you like, to paraphrase that ten years of your life, what were the best and worst bits of being in Bergerac for you? There were no worst bits, actually. It was like sitting down in front of a tonne of chocolate and slowly munching your way through it. It wasn't so much a job as a holiday. I spent all 12 years living there idyllic place and particularly for children and my daughter came to live with me over there in Jersey and uh, she's still there with her family and uh, it was a wonderful time in my life I made a lot of friends over there and when I retire I think I should probably go back there was he fun to play Jim Bergerac was it a sort of fun because it was quite a sort of oh it was oh, wonderful yeah wonderful <laughs> leather jacket yeah, yeah. And the, the fast car. I did hear a story. What was your view on the car? I, I heard you maybe not found the car a bit tricky because well, you're quite a, a tall fella. The car itself, it has to be said, was rather like um, John Thor's E-Type. Looked very good on camera, but in fact to drive it in you know, around the lanes or on the roads was just very, very difficult. The top speed of this thing was about 50 miles an hour downhill with a following wind. Had to have two batteries because the engine didn't work correctly and was just a wreck. And it was very, very dangerous to drive. The bonnet of that thing is a 1947 Triumph a Roadster. is about 10 foot long. Uh, the roads in Jersey are very narrow and are bordered by very high hedges. Come to a T-junction, you've got to hang out <laughs> that long bonnet <laughs> across well, the road. And hope, hope for God. the best, I guess, yeah. yeah. Hope for the best, yeah, oh, yeah. You mentioned with the story earlier about Patrick Stewart. Much like him, as soon as the Bergerac thing finished, you went back to the theatre and back to Shakespeare. I did, yes. Now, yeah. the TV and the theatre, is there a meeting you prefer or do you just love the whole thing about performing? They offer very different kinds of delights. They really do. I mean, television will give you access to a huge audience. I once worked it out that in order to reach as many people in the theatre as I do on television, I'd have to act for 80 years to a packed house twice a day. You see the difference there. Mm. Uh, but the difficulty, the problem, if you like, for an actor, of course, is the scripts tend to be a bit better in the theatre. Shakespeare is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, you can't really fault much with his work. You play some great roles in some fantastic Shakespeare plays over the years. The point you've just made with the TV stuff, yeah, if you wanted to raise your profile, then, yeah, obviously TV does give you a different kind of status but if you wanted to concentrate on the acting then obviously Shakespeare's still very well respected you, could you kind of f feel that still oh yeah 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 the difficulty is of course the theatre though it provides us with better scripts it uh, doesn't pay quite as much I was worked it out I was doing a I was actually doing a pantomime and uh, I worked it out that uh, the pay I got in the theatre, uh, I'd have to work for three years at the Royal Shakespeare Company to get six weeks' worth of wages that I got from the pantomime. Just to end this part of the interview, back on our TV screens, which we're delighted about, with the Midsummer Murders uh, show, again yeah. playing a member of the police, as it's almost uh, a sort of TV typecast for you, I guess. How did that come about, and what is that like to make at the moment? It it's terrific. I was at the RC again, and uh, this gentleman comes at me, uh, Brian Trumay, the producer, and says, are you interested in doing another television detective? I said, no. I've done 12 years of it. I don't really want to do any more. 
And then he mentioned a sum of money, and I said yes. And consequently, and I thought we'd just go for about four, five episodes, you know. And here we are, 12 years down the line, still doing it. And very pleasurable it is, too. Fantastic. John Nettles, for the time being, thank you very much. We'll talk more shortly, including about the reason why you are actually here today. That on the way very shortly. Neil Quigley. So that is part one of me interviewing John Nettles on my radio show for his TV documentary at the same time. So we're doing the radio interview as normal, but through the various windows to the studio, they have one camera, and the camera keeps moving around to do all the filming. So we're doing it normally as a radio show, but there is very much a camera buzzing around us. Which for John, he's probably quite used to that. Me, not quite so much. It was very rare I actually got filmed while doing the radio show. Anyway, here's part two of our conversation, after which I'll tell you what happened when he interviewed me and what happened when the TV show went out on ITV West Country. Neil Quigley. Still got my guest with me today, John Nettles. And John, you're here filming a brand new TV show. Tell us about the new series that you're involved in and what your involvement is. My part is very entertaining for me. It's called Applause. It's about people in the West Country, boys and girls, who deserve applause for what they do, particularly in the world of the arts and anything creative. You know, we work from David Inshaw up in Bridport right down to Kurt Jackson in Cornwall, been down to the, the Tate Galleries and so on and seen the Cornish artists at work and we all over Devon, we at Gidley Park Hotel yesterday talking to the wonderful chef down there, talking to people who are creative in whatever medium they choose, be that in, in, in music, in drama, food, whatever. And we're here to, you know, it's kind of a celebration of the arts and the creative activity down here in the southwest. I've got a list of the topics for this series, which are quite unusual. Can you explain a bit about some of the uh, topics of the, the series? As I say, we're looking at people who uh, create things and this covers a, a huge canvas and we're talking to the big people and the small people as well. And we've talked to, in the past, we've talked to uh, novelists and, as I say, artists. Couldn't talk a length of it, of course, because he's dead, but we'd have loved to have d- done that. And it's, as I say, it is a celebration of these, these people down here. And we're going to the, uh, let's talk to some of the actors who live down here. I've noticed that actors these days, if they get a bit of money, you know, they come down, buy their bit of thatch, view of the sea, and say, Settle down like proper people. Yeah, more and more it's sort of uh, heading down in this direction, not just from the UK, from like uh, America and overseas, you know, uh, performers as well, realising the beauty of the West Country. That is right. But if you go down, come, come down this part of the world and shout, work, a dozen doors open, and out come the Thessians saying, I'm here, I'm available, please hire me. It's lovely. Also as well, amongst the topics, I've just been looking at them, I've noticed there's one called Power and Greed. What's power and greed all about, John? Power and, well, uh, that's to do with, it was lovely, uh, uh, Trevor Reeve did a programme the other day playing Huey Green, and that has to do with the power games that people who are in the entertainment industry play, and uh, the greed that uh, some of us in showbiz uh, exhibit in the course of a career. The desire for fame is quite extraordinary, as it expresses itself sometimes. People will go to extraordinary lengths and become extraordinarily monstrous in their behaviour, in their search for fame, and for glory. There is a difference between performing and fame, isn't there? There's a lot of people who, I think nowadays more so, don't necessarily want to be a respected actor, a respected musician, a respected whatever. They just want to be famous. They want to be a celebrity. What do you want to be? I want a celebrity, as if it were a profession. And uh, what they will do anything, anything at all, to become a celebrity. Time was, of course, when you were celebrated. You became a celebrity because you did something very, very well. You played the violin, you were an to you whatever you were you, you did well and you became celebrated for that reason nowadays you're celebrated because you're a celebrity people see you they recognize you for what they don't know apart from the fact they recognized you before from somewhere you obviously experienced that a lot particularly i would imagine the height of i mean how was that from the celebrity point of view you're just you know you're out wandering maybe you're walking around and you've got people coming up to you is the, did you like that or not really or it, I I like it a lot because it's a kind of recognition, you know, that uh, people do recognise you, and that's some index of success. In my own life, been mistaken for a policeman. Remember in Jersey, there was a fellow fell off the cliff, quite close to where I was staying, and um, I called out the police and the in 
sure lifeboat was scrambled. All the emergency services came to the cliff top and they were asking me for instruction. I was called Sergeant. What, what do we do now, Sergeant? What do you do? What should we do? You know, I said, I'm an actor. I don't write anything for this. I... Yeah, I mean, there's no <laughs> script. I don't, know what, I don't know what to say next or what I'm supposed to do. I can't do this. I can't do this. But uh, the actual recognition thing is, is lovely. Everywhere I go now, I'm recognised. See, the midsummer sales to, I think, 209. I didn't know there were 209 countries, but apparently there are, and we sell to every one of them. Works cross nation. It works across it the board. It does. I believe it or not, odd effect on people. The Russians actually think this is the way we live. That there are murders every every week <laughs> in Buckinghamshire. And that you know, vicars are all murderers, and that uh, spinsters are, are all killers, and all that, all those kind of assumptions are made. The Australians they like it because of the scenery, because of the greenness. It reminds them of home, they say. You know? And the Americans love it. There was one officer from the Chicago police force wrote to me and saying, "John, I, I I really admire your your police methods. They're the same that I employ." And I think, well. The murder rate must be very, very high in Chicago <laughs> and the clear-up rate very, very it's, it's low. About, talking about American TV shows, I know there is an American TV show that you particularly, you, you, you favour. You've got a, you've got a favourite police show yourself, I understand. I do. CSI uh, Miami is for me. Why? What do you I, like about for, that? On all, from all points of view, it's the way it's presented and it's particularly David Caruso, who is my favourite TV actor of all time. He knows no shame. He will do anything anything with the sunglasses with the guns and with his uh, oh he's wonderful there's one shot i remember he always wears sunglasses and he was raiding a room in a hotel he kicked the door open he had the gun up under his chin you know his favorite method and he went into the room still his sunglasses on and he took his sunglasses off and hung the sunglasses on his gun as he advanced on the criminal now that is courage so that's genius isn't it really? I, I like touches like that I, I like things where you just add a little bit of humor to those sort of situations i think it helps oh this was fall over laughing time it was wonderful wonderful i've sent a, an actress who, who's working over there a, a message to get me his autograph i just love him to pieces i'll get you, let's get you in the show let's get you a part in csi that's I, what we want i want to be if malcolm mcdowell can do it i can do it yeah definitely they'll sort your flights out we'll, we'll make some calls john nettles thanks for joining us today and best of luck with john nettles applauds the new series which we're doing some filming for today as well, which uh, we're looking forward to and having a good time doing. So uh, thanks for joining us. All the best for the show. And thank you. Neil Quigley. That is the radio interview I did with John Nettles for his TV documentary, Nettles Applause, which, of course, they filmed as well. So they were going to use some of that in the actual programme. After my show had finished, we then moved to the second studio because we only had two studios at the radio station and the one I was in doing my show was now being inhabited by the person doing the afternoon show, so we had to switch studios. The camera was set up and then it was time to turn the tables. It was time for John Nettles to interview me. I must confess that was one of my first experiences with TV and I quite liked getting mic'd up by the salmon and having the clip-on mics you see on TV shows and getting the camera there and getting ready to have the chat. Now, because we only had one camera, basically we had to have the conversation a couple of times, once with the camera pointed at John and then once with the camera pointed at me. So basically he got to interview me twice. Now, during the interview with me, he was asking me what it was like to be on the radio. Did I have a different persona when I was on the radio? And I tried to explain all these things the best I could. Then during that interview, I said a phrase that I've never said before or since. I have no idea where it came from, it just suddenly appeared. He asked me a question somewhere along the lines of what it was like doing live radio when, you know, things occasionally do go wrong. How do you cope? What do you do? How do you get through those difficult situations? And I thought for a second, and I don't know where this phrase came from, I promise you I've never used it before and I've never used it since in conversation. I just said, well, you know, when things get a bit tough, when they go wrong, you've just got to power on basically. Then we wrapped the filming for the day, said goodbye to John and said goodbye to the film crew. I did ask them to let me know when it was going to be shown on TV. The premiere of the episode of the show that I was in was to be shown in the summer. And as it happens, I was on my holidays down in Newquay at that point. It was being shown quite early on in the evening at half past six on ITV West Country. I was actually holidaying with a mate on a campsite in Newquay. Now, luckily, it was quite a decent campsite, so they had a TV room. Basically, I had to kind of book and secure the TV room so I could watch the show and see what it was like and see if I made an idiot of myself or if it was fine. I think this was just coincidence rather than a bad review, but as it turned out, it ended up just being me and my mate sitting in the TV room waiting for this show to start. 
and then it starts. It is actually quite an arty show in the end. It's quite in-depth. It does a lot of discussions and it had a certain look to it as well. But we're watching it. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. Then about 12 minutes in, I see an external shot of the radio station I was working at and a very quick clip of me before they went to the ad break. So I now know I'm on the way. I've definitely made it into the TV show, but I now have a couple of minutes to wait during the ad break. Comes out of the ad break, back to the Ivel FM studios, and they show a little bit of the conversation I had with John on my radio show, with him doing some voiceovers, saying how he doesn't really feel in control because I'm in charge, I'm asking the questions, I've done the research. He felt it was kind of reading a bit, a bit uncomfortable. Then they show John interviewing me when the tables are turned and the conversation I had with him, including when I was trying to describe what you do when things go wrong on live radio. And I use that phrase, power on basically. Would you believe that was actually the last bit they used from the interview? So my out words on that television show with John Nettles were power on basically. It was a fun experience and I really enjoyed doing it. And it was great to meet John Nettles as well. He was fantastic, really nice, really friendly, such a great bloke. And he definitely has an aura, a presence about him. And I must confess, I have still got the entire show on DVD. I've not watched it for a while, but after this, I may have to dig it out and watch it again. That's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening. Have fun, take care, have a fantastic seven days, look after each other, and remember, power on basically. Bye-bye.